So hello and welcome everybody again to yet another OpenShift Commons briefing. Um, this time I'm really um, excited actually to, to finally get to see and um, learn more about Grid Engine from Univa. Um, it's been something we've been looking forward to having them present. Um, today we have a whole crew from um, the, the Grid Engine um, team, uh, Rob Lalon, uh, Cameron Bruner, Ian Lum, and we're going to let um, Rob kick it off and tell us a little bit about what Grid Engine is and how um, we can make it work um, for scaling on OpenShift and Kubernetes. So, Rob, why don't you take it away? And we'll we'll open it up for Q and A after the presentation. If you have questions, post them in the chat, and we'll try and answer them as we go. And then we'll read the off the questions that aren't answered at the very end and open it up for conversation. So, go ahead, Rob. Excellent. Thanks, Diane. Give me a thumbs up if everybody can hear me okay. And uh, yeah, we'll, we'll keep up. So I'm Rob Lalone. I'm general manager of the NavOps product line. NavOps is the product line within the Unova company that is uh, centered around containers, and Grid Engine is our core product from the core business. We'll, we'll talk about and clarify how all that works. So I'm on the line. We've got Ian Lum here, our chief, our, our sorry, our solutions architect. I almost gave him a promotion there. And we've got Cameron Bruner on the phone, and he's uh, he's our solution, our chief architect. I'll get it right, yeah. Our chief architect with the NavOps product line. So uh, we'll let uh, the smart guys do the talking, and I'll do a little bit of an introduction on the solutions. So just a bit of background so you know where we've come from. And a lot of the core Red Hat customers might know us already because we've got literally thousands of customers using our product between the open source solution and the commercial solution, and 95% of those customers are running on Red Hat. So we're in the HPC technical computing business. We've been around for many years. We acquired the Grid Engine product from Sun by uh, Oracle, so people might know the Sun Grid Engine name more so than they even know the Unova name because it's got a real uh, rich legacy. And uh, we, we're most of us uh, on the phone here are in Toronto. Uh, Jumping in just to our customers, just a little bit to give you a sense of the scale we deal with. We deal with some of the largest companies in the world, the largest oil and gas company in the world. Saudi Aramco uses us. Uh, we're dealing with some of the biggest clusters in the world as well as the biggest companies, right? people running 5 million jobs a day, 11 of the top 12 life sciences companies use us. And these are real big grids for everything from uh, doing fluid dynamics analysis to check airflow on F1 cars, to designing BMWs, to doing molecular modeling and genome sequencing, to oil and gas exploration in the financial sector, doing a risk analysis and machine learning type applications, all, all kinds of things. But wherever people need to spread load across a very large grid of computers and really achieve supercomputing with that grid, uh, we're, we're the guys that often are doing the scheduling and the distributed resource management behind that. What I'd like to do is just turn it over to Ian for a few minutes to talk about the core product, Grid Engine, and then I'll take it back and we'll talk a little bit about how Grid Engine is being used within the uh, container world within the NavOps line and how that applies to Kubernetes and OpenShift. So over to Ian. Thanks a lot, Rob. So uh, Rob's given you a nice uh, introduction and some context for high-performance computing. And the, the core sort of flagship technology that, uh, as Rob has mentioned, has a really rich open source legacy is our Grid Engine product. And really what it's all about is trying to uh, handle the supply-demand equation in the very complex technical computing environments that uh, he described, or at least gave you some examples of. So basically what it's all about is trying to match what uh, applications require, might be software licenses, uh, might be specific hardware like a, a GPU, for example, uh, with uh, where those resources are available. Uh, in, in the enterprise in some sense. And doing all of that subject to a, um, a, a set of stated policies for uh, allocating those resources. And those policies are very important for our discussion today because they turn out to be uh, central to what we're now introducing with um, NavOps Command. <clears throat> but more on that in a moment. So what this means is that uh, this allows organizations to really get the most out of their, uh, their infrastructure. And as you can see from this slide here, uh, we really are in um, some of the largest, uh, most substantial enterprises. We have customers that are literally running millions of jobs per day. Uh, some of their clustered environments are um, on the orders of, uh, you know, multiple hundreds of thousands of, of cores. And in some cases, uh, 
you know, for example, some of those financial use cases that uh, Rob alluded to, we're talking about um, people running uh, jobs in, in, you know, very, very uh, uh, tight succession. So maybe we can go to the next one, Rob. <clears throat> and uh, just waiting for this to refresh here. Here we go. <laughs> so very quickly, uh, we support a variety of different uh, types of workload. It's not just batch, it's uh, low latency workloads as well as big data workloads, whether you're using Spark or uh, perhaps uh, some kind of a, uh, a Hadoop component, for example. Um, as I mentioned, we, we are able to handle all kinds of uh, very specialized uh, devices, including GPUs, and uh, stay tuned for more on the, uh, the Intel front uh, coming very soon. Um, and we uh, are supporting a variety of different uh, use cases that include not only shared memory parallel applications, but also distributed memory parallel applications like uh, MPI. And so in the next slide, what we're going to show you very quickly is the, uh, the three-tier architecture that applies to, uh, to Grid Engine. So there are a variety of uh, different interface points for the, uh, the software. Um, as you might expect, there's a, a command line interface but there's also, uh, there are also a, a number of APIs as access points as well. Um, some of these are standards-based. Uh, actually, they're all standards-based, really, just different standards. One of them is a RESTful API, um, and one of them uh, uses a, a, a standard and distributed resource management. The brains of the uh, operation is something we call our master host or our queue master host, and uh, this host uh, serves a number of different uh, purposes, but this is where the, um, the policies actually get put into place as uh, workload comes in in real time and needs to be scheduled out to the uh, the back end uh, execution agents. So that's just a very quick um, overview. So I'll hand it back to Rob now to kind of take this and, and frame uh, how we're using this expertise in, in the NavOps context. Absolutely. So, so what we've done is we've taken our core products and a couple of years ago we started moving them into the container world. So we don't really talk about Grid Engine within NavOps, although as, as Diane aptly titled the, the presentation, it's about teaching Grid Engine to speak Kubernetes and OpenShift, but we refer to the product as Command. And command is the product that uh, is, is doing this within the Kubernetes context. So let's just take a step back for a second and talk about why you do all this. So for us, it's about improving server utilization, optimizing cloud expenditures. Uh, you can see at the bottom there, Gartner says that the average industry server utilization rate is at 12%. That varies on time of day, by company, by type of application, obviously. But 12% is just a kind of an astonishingly low number. And when you start looking at how uh, cloud utilization is growing. It's growing at almost 20% a year, according to IDC, up to 2019. And at 2019, it's supposed to be almost 50% of an IT organization's budget is cloud expenditures. So it's, it's different when you've already got sunk costs and you've got machines sitting in your data center. Uh, if those aren't being utilized, it's kind of money that's been spent anyway. It's not optimal, but it is what it is. But when it's cloud, it's spending money every day. And if you can be utilizing that those cloud resources more efficiently, and turning them off when they're not used and sizing them right, you're going to save a lot of money. And when you're talking about 50% of your IT budget, it can be pretty significant. So you look at the top issues from Amazon, their top issues were, uh, or in their top 10 were things like oversized instances, people running too many instances, and instances running idle. And that's really what command is about. It's about running things more efficiently. On top of that, our world is getting more complex. So while containers, container-based applications, CID, CICD, all these great things have a real place, and we're obviously moving in that direction for good reason, it does uh, get a little more complex. Applications decompose from monolithic applications, singular applications, down to many, many microservices and containers, and those containers can be in replicas so that there's there's a, a scale issue there when it comes to uh, how to manage all of these things. And there's also software-defined layers as well, so your networking and storage is now defined uh, in software. You've got new constituents involved, people in DevOps introducing uh, new processes and new software to manage the deployment and management of the applications. And that's where our policy management and event scheduling comes in. So we have two solutions in our container line, in our NavOps line, if you will. There's Launch, which allows you to very easily provision a cluster, whether that's on-premise or in the cloud or in hybrid. But today we're talking about command and its relevance to, to Kubernetes and to OpenShift. So it's, again, it's all about 
you know, sizing those machines properly, about getting the right workload onto those machines, dynamically provisioning them, and the policy engine that drives that. And uh, I'm excited to get to Cameron's portion of the presentation because he's going he's gonna to show us this stuff in action. We've kind of talked about this, uh, interestingly, in the brownfield. In brownfield companies, which most of us are in, you have existing uh, architectures, you have the existing software running, and you want to blend that workload with your container workload so you don't have to isolate those on different servers. It's different for dot-coms, you're building siloed applications, you're running kind of one monolithic application. If you're if you're an Uber, I recognize that they have multiple applications within their suite, but it's th very different than major bank A or B that has hundreds of different applications and mainframes and Linux systems and all kinds of things. So managing those workloads in context and not just looking at your microservice and container workloads is important too, and that's what NavOps Command is partially about. So it's about taking disparate workloads, putting those on the right machine so that containers that need to run on the same machine for latency reasons can run on the same machine or on the same subnet, and containers that shouldn't be on the same machine for security reasons or network or what have you can be separated, and really packing those machines as tightly as possible to optimize the use. And I'll let Ian, Ian talk a little bit more about the use cases. I told the, the guys here that we had to do a demonstration of the installation of our software, and here we go, and it's installed. Just kidding. But I did want to talk about the Kubernetes architecture a little bit. So on the right-hand side, you've got the worker nodes, there's the kubelet and the uh, proxy server. Those handle the communications to the worker and the distribution of work at, at the worker node level. Uh, we've got the API server, which is a very important component that handles all the communications to all the other master components, to SCD and to the worker nodes. There's a controller manager that's handling replication. So as you want to replicate, say, an Nginx database and have 10 of those running, the controller manager will make sure those are all running. And if you lose a node or you lose a pod, that the controller manager will handle that replication. And then there's the scheduler, and that's where we come in. We talk at the Kubernetes API level, and we turn off the Kubernetes scheduler and replace it with our scheduler, which is more than a scheduler. It's also a, a very significant, robust a policy engine that uh, can handle matching the organization's requirements with how things are going to be distributed on the, on the hardware. So command, as, it, as I said, it talks to Kubernetes. We're seeing a lot of OpenShift out there, and uh, they're very significant for us in our customer base. We run on top of any Kubernetes distribution, as you can see there. Uh, and within the OpenShift context, you can see a command slots in on top of the scheduler and uh, on top of Kubernetes within OpenShift. I'd like to turn it over to Ian to talk a little bit about the use cases and how these fit in from a business perspective, and then we'll hand it to Cameron for a demonstration. Thanks, Rob. Uh, I do want to emphasize that uh, we didn't just you know, come up with these use cases from uh, uh, our creative imaginations. This is uh, everything that we have here has really been derived from this wealth of experience we've had in addressing the workload management requirements of our enterprise customers in high-performance computing for uh, really quite a number of years. Uh, and that's why uh, some of them might uh, strike you as being a bit esoteric or unusual if you're not familiar with this kind of thing, but uh, suffice it to say, we've really, you know, battle tested these in uh, in, in other contexts. So uh, one of the, um, you, you know, one of the most uh, relevant things that uh, we can add, I think, to the game here is the ability to introduce more in the way of access control lists. Um, in, in some ways, you can think of this as perhaps um, giving you a little bit more uh, in the way of flexibility. Uh, and perhaps uh, helping to uh, to close off some of the concerns that uh, organizations might have with respect to the security of uh, of containers. Uh, in terms of something completely different, we have the idea of being able to make a reservation for uh, pools of uh, resources, if you like, at some time in the future. Uh, that might be for a specific application, uh, perhaps for a, a specific purpose. And this ensures that you've got uh, a portion of the infrastructure carved out in a fairly logical sense to um, ensure that applications get the resources that they require. As Rob alluded to before, we have ways of fitting um, and placing containers uh, subject to some kind of, uh, of an algorithm, uh, depending on uh, what the objective is, because there could be a, a number of uh, different objectives. It could be 
uh, driving towards utilization on the fewest number of resources, or it could be some other uh, objective. A lot of our customers in HPC have contention-based uh, use cases uh, where you have, for example, perhaps different kinds of applications, and we've given you some examples there from uh, big data analytics perhaps competing with um, some sort of a database um, infrastructure. Uh, this is extremely common. You, we also see a lot in the way of projects that need to compete for the same uh, finite pool of uh, resources. And so uh, the, the infrastructure that we've been building is going to be able to help you uh, split those rather uh, effectively. Another policy that seems to be uh, extremely appealing is that every so often something extremely important comes along and it may be necessary to preempt already executing uh, containers, pods, et cetera, what have you, uh, to, uh, to allow for that more uh, important workload to, uh, to receive the appropriate degree of uh, resource allocation. So we can handle that as well. And then finally, just uh, to kind of give you a little bit of a sense, uh, another key component is that we recognize there could be a need uh, that there be dependencies between different components of the infrastructure. So that's something we have a lot of experience with in our, uh, our past, and we're bringing that uh, to this, uh, this new realm through NavOps Command in the context of orchestration. Uh, so just to you know, further amplify what, what we're going to talk about uh, momentarily, and particularly the demo that Cameron's going to give, will actually give you a sense as to how some of these use cases are actually starting to take shape in the case of our NavOps Command product. So let me hand it back over to uh, Rob at this point. Yeah, thanks, Ian. Well, we're actually going to hand uh, to Cameron now, okay. Diane. So if you could, uh, Cameron, I guess if you could grab the screen and take over, that would be great. Just give him a minute to do that. Okay. Can you see my uh, screen at this point? Absolutely. Okay, great. So yeah, so what I'm going to be showing here is kind of the current state of our uh, interface to NavOps Command which is the, uh, the scheduler, uh, the, the container scheduler solution that uh, both uh, Ian and, and Rob have been discussing. So we're going to go through some of the use cases, too, that uh, really that uh, Ian had just brought up on that previous slide. So the first place that we're going to go in here uh, is to kind of look at our uh, pod placement. So um, really here with, uh, with this, this is kind of a high level kind of general scheduler placement strategy allows you to say whether or not you would like to uh, spread or uh, pack uh, your uh, containers. Um, so try to use the minimum amount of nodes or try to spread it out to use more nodes but keep the load down on each node. So there could be reasons why you would want to do that. Or you can go by maximum utilization where it will just try to uh, maximize your other policy uh, parameters to make sure that you get the best utilization, the most amount of pods running in your given system. We also support the ability to mix um, for different types of workloads. So for certain users or for certain projects, you could say, I want to spread for them or I'd like to uh, pack for them. So what you'll find as I go through here is a lot of the things that we're going to be talking about are more control over where the actual work runs and how it runs, as well as the, uh, the order in which the work runs. So this one, this screen here is really mostly talking about the actual placement of work. The next, uh, the next section I'd like to go to here is, the, um, is our access restrictions and runtime quotas. So this is a namespace-centric uh, kind of policy configuration dialog, and it allows you to um, go through your namespaces and set different policies for each, uh, for each namespace. So right here, this namespace one is a uh, Kubernetes namespace. Uh, you could consider it like a default. Um, and here, if we go into its access uh, restrictions and runtime quotas, we can see a whole bunch of parameters that we can set. So first, you can grant uh, to specific users and group access. So who can go and actually use this quote, uh, this this namespace? Um, you can explicitly deny if you'd rather go go that route. You can also decide which hosts are going to participate in um, in a given namespace, and this could be because you want to limit certain hosts to certain users or certain projects based on special capabilities that those hosts may have. We also have the ability here to uh, limit uh, the ability to run privileged containers in a given namespace or also uh, uh, disable host or allow host networking. Additionally, we support uh, quotas. Um, and these are different than the normal Kubernetes quotas, uh, which you know, if, if you're familiar with Kubernetes quotas, they prevent 
the uh, actual admission of resources into the system, which we'll still, we still believe is very valuable with uh, command. What these quotas do inside of command, though, is um, additionally allow you to limit based on the current running uh, conditions in the, in the system. So this would allow you to say that I don't ever want a certain number of uh, certain users in this namespace to use more than a total of three gigabytes of RAM or limit the instead of by user uh, to projects uh, or even through application profiles, which are kind of templates for describing how you would like to uh, be able to run work inside of a given namespace. We'll get a little bit more to application profiles uh, later on in the system, uh, in this demo. You can also limit uh, to, um, to specific hosts. So you can say that there's different hosts that have different limits inside of, of your given quota inside of your namespace. And this is kind of the simple way of co configuring quotas. We, we support a much more advanced, uh, robust uh, way of, of adding quotas if, if you need to do something a little more sophisticated. Going on to our next uh, bit of policy, we support, you know, let me slide this over a little bit. We also support a proportional share. So this allows you to um, try to balance the uh, distribution of work inside of your cluster uh, based on um, you know, projects and users, and let's say the importance of a, of a given uh, project or user's work, uh, or just group's work in, uh, in your environment. And what this will let you do is allow you to say that this work is more important. So when um, you run into resource constraints, so let's say you don't have enough hosts or you only have 10 GPU hosts, but you have 20 pods that want to use GPUs, you can use this to decide which um, host should get, which user should be able to get those first. And after they use it for a while, you know, it will automatically let additional work that might want to use those, uh, those GPU resources um, that may not be as important, but the fact that they were not able to run for a while, they'll eventually get their fair share and be able to uh, get a little bit of work in as well. We support an arbitrary level of, uh, of, of depth here and grouping both on project and by user. Another thing that we can support with command is uh, interleaving. Um, this will allow you to say, um, as, as you're scaling up a given application, and here we're, we're referencing application profiles. So let's say you have your WordPress application, um, and as it scales up, you know you need to scale uh, some other application as well. So this will adjust the priorities of work such that when you do scale up your, your application, scale up your replicas for both of these, that they get placed in a, a certain uh, ratio as opposed to a whole bunch of one getting placed and another not getting placed and then you're running out of resources and having an inefficient imbalance of, um, of application instances. We can also um, do interleaving uh, between uh, different types of, um, of, of projects and, uh, and uh, resources here as well. So, and here is an additional way where we can go and do interleaving based on the actual nodes and their capabilities. Uh, so we can say between uh, pods that are requesting these labels, place one first on the SSD and then one on the label one. Once again, it's more flexibility over you know, how you want your work placed and where the things uh, should go. And this really helps you cover situations where you may have you know, uh, some container, uh, have nodes or a rack, let's say, go down and you need to replace those, those pods that were running there and you're, you're running close to maximum capacity. These types of rules help make sure that when, those, when the work does get replaced, the right work gets, um, gets started first and you, you run in a, in, a, uh, in a proportion that actually allows your application to keep running successfully. Additionally, we allow for ranking of resources and this will allow you to prioritize work based uh, solely on the types of resources that are being requested. Now, this will work additionally with our other uh, ranking policies, um, but by doing this, you'll be able to say, I want to make sure that my GPU jobs um, schedule first uh, when, when we're looking at a resource constrained situation. Additionally, by saying here MEM uh, as being a higher one, that will allow you to schedule um, work that requires larger amounts of memory before smaller amounts of memory, which that's in general a very good um, kind of strategy as it allows you to get better uh, utilization of your resources. Um, if, you've, you know, if you um, scatter around a whole bunch of small uh, requesting jobs, you could uh, very well have on any given host not enough memory in order to service a very large requesting 
um, container. And this goes kind of to the point that Rob was making about you know uh, low server efficiency, uh, you know that 12% server uh, utilization. You know, putting in policies like this allow you to achieve better utilization while still maintaining the ability to run the applications that you want to be able to run when you want to be able to run them. So the next section I have here is application profile ranking. And this is where you can define different types of, uh, of classes of jobs and say which ones are more important. So just this sheer uh, fact that a workload matches one of these allows it to get a slightly higher priority in the system and be able to be scheduled first uh, over, over workloads of, of another one. Since we've talked a bit about application profiles at this point, I'll jump down there to that section, give you kind of like an idea of, of what, what these are, are about. So as you can see here, they kind of are roll-ups of uh, a whole bunch of, uh, of, of attributes. So you could think of this as being um, a, a, a grouping. So pretty much saying like with WordPress in this example, only um, publishers and the admin users can actually go and use this and the dev users cannot. That means that if we attach this WordPress profile to any of our other resources, um, only these users will be able to use it. It will also make sure that certain things are met when, uh, when they're set. So this would, would pretty much, by having this SSD host tag here, it would make sure that if somebody tried to submit a uh, pod that was to the WordPress uh, profile, that it would no longer, it, it would have to have this SSD host. Pretty much the admin saying that all WordPress applications need to run on machines with SSD, and it will make sure that that happens. Um, additionally, we can have uh, other labels that you know can be there that we would we would prefer to have when scheduling the pod, uh, but don't need to be there. So this would be you would want to be on an SSD host. It would have to have that, but you would prefer one that had a, uh, a already mounted good scratch file system, but would be able to tolerate uh, being placed on a node that does not have that. Additionally, the profiles can be set to direct projects so that you can actually have your projects set automatically and have and be tied into those types of ACLs and quotas as well. So we don't have much in the UI currently for configuring the projects, but generally they're just uh, the creation of a, of a name and then you, you are able to attach user objects. So those would be either users or user groups. Um, which are also very much like projects, which would just user groups are groups that hold um, a set of users or other user groups. So I hope that this kind of overview gives you an idea of what we're thinking and what we're going at when it comes to NavOps command and the types of situations that we really want to address. You know, in summary, it's uh, making sure that the most important work is the work that runs. Um, make sure that you know you're, uh, you get a good utilization out of your infrastructure, and really you bring you know the these these uh, lessons that we've learned over many years of supporting our high performance computing environments where utilization is very important, and uh, and time and uh, the placement of the work is of the of, of also of utmost importance. With that, I would like to uh, return it back to uh, Rob to uh, wrap up uh, the, the rest of this uh, presentation. Thanks, Cameron. That was excellent. Uh, unfortunately, we went extremely fast through all of our material, so we're, we're finished uh, well ahead of where we wanted, but hopefully people kind of got the gist of what it is we're, we're doing with command and how it fits in. We didn't spend a lot of time talking about it in the context of, of OpenShift, but I think it's it's logical how this would sit up above OpenShift at the scheduling level and make sure that the production workloads are running in the way that you've designed them to run using our policies. This product is uh, just reaching early access availability. As we said, it's based on the very mature grid engine, but we've canadarized it. We've put a web UI on it. It does have a kube control type of um, command line interface as well uh, that'll be available and uh, you could even uh, get real dirty and drop down to the grid engine interface if you wanted to, and that exposes a lot more capabilities. But I think uh, what you've seen through the UI is, is extremely rich and far richer than what's available for, for scheduling now, and we're real excited about it. So it's going to be available right after DockerCon, and we'll, uh, we'll send out an announcement of, as to when people can download it and try it out. So if you're running OpenShift, uh, we'd love to work with you on uh, showing you how it, all it wor how it all works. And if you're at DockerCon, certainly uh, we welcome you to come by. I think we're at S22 booth, and uh, we'd love to uh, show you the product in action in a little more detail. 
So with that, I thank you, and I'll turn it over to Diane. I don't know if we've got time for a Q&A or have any questions. So thanks uh, a lot, uh, both Rob and, and Cameron, too, because it's really interesting to see a different perspective on the policy management um, aspects of Kubernetes and OpenShift and um, taking it to that HPC world and, and the worldview of, that people need um, in order to manage and orchestrate those workloads. And um, so basically, from, from what I can tell, um, it, that you're making OpenShift and Kubernetes HPC ready. Is, is that a correct statement? I wouldn't say it's HPC ready. I think I think the way I would look at it is we're bringing those policy management and capabilities to OpenShift. So if people wanted to orchestrate microservice-based applications within OpenShift in a manner like they did with HPC, which just means far richer policy management, I'd say that that's, that's the approach we're taking. So I think HPC people will still use a distributed resource management system and not necessarily use Kubernetes. They, they could do it this way, but I don't know that that's the approach that most people will take. So I guess long story short is no, we're, we're, we're doing policy management and scheduling for microservice-based applications. Maybe I should have made that a little more clear at the top, uh, at the top of the hour. Okay. So you're bringing to bear all of your experience with HPC um, and large scale stuff to Kubernetes workloads and, and thus also to, to OpenShift. Yeah. So I, that's, I think, I think I got that. I was just trying to figure out how to frame it in almost a tweetable, it, yeah. capable, you know, how, how can <laughs> all of what Cameron just said in uh, 140 characters or less. So uh, no, <laughs> no, it was really good because it's, it's one of those things is grid engine has been around for a while. It's got a huge customer base and a huge user base and lots of um, good, Good folks doing very, very interesting. Lots of Red Hat customers doing very interesting uh, work with it. So I'm really um, going to be interested to see how um, taking all of that experience and bringing it to uh, microservices um, can help out some of the, the workloads that we have um, running on OpenShift uh, now today. And um, it's going to be, uh, we're going to have to have you back once you launch again and um, see if we can't get a, a cluster access for you to do a demo against um, and compare and contrast um, doing it with, with, with raw, shall I say, raw OpenShift um, versus um, uh, using the, the command piece. I think that will be very an interesting comparison. And I'm also going to be interested to see um, once people get their hands on the grid engine w command NavOps way of doing things, if they won't um, try and drive some of that advanced policy management back into the Kubernetes open source project. Yeah, that's that's definitely a possibility. You know, I think you know, there's all kinds of engineering investment going on in, in Kubernetes, and uh, the scheduler is one place where you know there could be a lot more work done. So it could could start to move up closer to to what we're doing. They've added batch workloads. That's not really scheduler specific, but they've added some batch capabilities and. You know, 1.2, I think it is, and you know, there's more and more happening there. So you're right; it'll it'll start uh, getting richer and richer over time. Yeah. And we'd love to we'd love to show the product on OpenShift next time around. We'd also love to talk about some re real life use cases as well by then. Yeah, and if I could just add in, it's Ian here again, um, Diane, just wanted to add in that you know there are, there are many use cases that we'll be able to support, but certainly our experience from high performance computing suggests that there are some uh, some policies, the implementation of some policies that are extremely broadly implemented across uh, the entire customer base, almost regardless of which uh, which vertical market is represented, and uh, that uh, that really relates to some of the um, the share based policies that uh, we talked about on the use cases slide and that Cameron demonstrated. So um, I could see that as being something people might want to uh, provide some kind of an implementation for. Uh, you know, perhaps in the, the open source uh, implementation. Right. I think we're a long way from that. So, and, and there's so many other pieces, yeah. moving pieces to Kubernetes. I, I'm just like, I think that what, you, what you're probably going to give people is the way to do it now. And, um, and maybe they'll drive some of that back into Kubernetes, the project itself, or into OpenShift. Um, someday, but I, I really think um, there's so many other pieces that people are working on that you've solved a good 
good chunk of the scheduling um, issue. So this is a, a great opportunity for people to, to take advantage of your experience and for Grid Engine to, to shine in a, in a new world, in a new world order. Right. So thank you again. Well, thanks again, Dave. Joining me today, um, uh, we'll be back on next week, and uh, we will see you at DockerCon, and we'll, I know we're going to see you at Red Hat Summit probably too. So um, there'll be lots of time to to check it out. And um, OpenShift Online today just went live um, for the dev preview, so maybe we can even um, uh, get some demos going there. Though I think you need your own cluster to install um, rather than using our dev preview. So. We'll get up. we'll get you access to a cluster pretty quick here. Awesome. Thanks everyone. All right, thank you all.